We're in week four of Broken to Breakthrough. It's a relationship series. This weekend, though, we're talking about the relationship between the church, God's people, and the world without Christ. Because that is a broken relationship today. And, and if it's ever needed a breakthrough in this world, it's now. The only hope of this world is Jesus. That's it. I mean, there is no other answer. He, he is the answer to the world. That's why he's called a savior. And yet, it isn't only him. It's his body. If he is the only hope of the world, that means his church is the only hope of the world. And most Christians don't even know that. Most Christians don't even understand it or even believe it. But my hope today before you leave is that you have a revelation of what it means to be in relationship with the world without Christ. Because if you're not careful, you will not represent Jesus well to a world without him. It is very easy in our culture today to get caught up in the political environment, in, in criticizing people, uh, people that have made strong political movements toward choices that, that, or behaviors that, that we would say, boy, that, that opposes God. And if we're not careful, we become the opposition. And I, my hope is that when you leave today, you see as a Christian, you are certainly called to have a godly standard. This is not an issue of everything's right and there is no wrong. That's not what I said at all, nor am I even intimating that. But what I'm trying to say today, and it's critical that we grasp it with all of our hearts, is that Jesus came to set people free. He came to deliver people. He didn't come to make me to go into every environment and try to convince people to change behaviors. That's not why he came. And if we're not careful, we become the opposition. And I think when you see how Jesus operated, Somehow, I think the church, God's people, we don't necessarily reflect him well. And since he's the head of the church, we should, how many of you think we ought to reflect his heart? Well, that's our call. Amen. That's a good thing to do. Now, let me talk to you about the doctrine of, of self-righteousness that Jesus was out of his skin about. Man, he, he was so adamant about this. In fact, I'm going to read you a scripture where he tells you to beware of this doctrine. And I'm going to tell you, I want to show you today how easily we slip into it. And this, I believe, is the poison that can make us ineffective in reaching our world for Christ. Let me read to you what Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 6. He said, watch out, Jesus warned them. Beware of the yeast, referring to the doctrine, of the Pharisees and the scribes, or the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, the Pharisees and Sadducees were just two of the main religious groups of leadership. And the difference between them is one believed in the resurrection, the other didn't. Here's how you can remember it. The Sadducees did not believe in the res resurrection because they were sad, you see. <laughs> okay, let me try this side. Anyway, that was, okay, maybe you don't care. But anyway, you know, this, these two groups of people were telling people how to be made right with God by doing things and things they told them to do. And they were trying to produce a self-righteousness in people. They said, follow me, follow my rules. No, you follow my rules. My rules will make you right with God. And Jesus made it so clear. And by the way, I'm going to tell you some of the things Jesus said about these people. And Jesus, uh, you know, we see him in the Bible as, and people present him as this kind of kind, only soft, kind of like he would come into the place and go, I am here to talk to you. you go, what, Jesus? Right here. No, this, he, he was able to speak to 5,000 people without a, a sound system. This man, his heart was come, it came out of his mouth. And when you see what he said to these people, see, the, the, the self-righteousness was so ingrained. There was a rich young ruler that came to Jesus, and he said, Good master, what do I have to do to earn or inherit eternal life? You know what Jesus said to him? He said, Why do you call me good? There's no one good but God. Say that out loud. There's no one good but God. No one good but God. Now remember, he's asking the question, how do I get right with God? What do I have to do? Jesus said, why are you calling me good? Now he, of course, Jesus is God in the flesh. That man doesn't know that. He's saying, why are you trying to come to God based on your goodness? Don't you know there is no one good but God? No one. No one can earn him. And he told Jesus all the things that he did, and I've kept this commandment from my youth, that commandment from my youth. Basically, I'm ready to go. Jesus said, I'll tell you what, here's what you can do. Go sell everything you have, give it to the poor, come follow me. 
And the man went away because he had much money. He said, no. I wonder what he thinks about that money today. I wonder. But Jesus was showing him, son, you can't earn this. And when self-righteousness falls to us, let me tell you how easily it, it can happen. Here's self-righteousness, simply. If you think there is anybody on this planet worse than you, it's self-righteousness. If you think there's anybody on the planet better than you, you believe in self-righteousness. So what do you mean worse or better? Well, a mass murderer, I'm better than a mass murderer. No, you're not. Because no one is good without a savior. Well, I'm not that bad. That, that's okay. It's like everybody falling into a bonfire and, and we're all going to get burned, but you get in there sooner than I do. But we're all in the same fire. There is no way out of this. There is no way to redeem yourself. And it infuriated Jesus when the self-righteous Pharisees tried to teach their doctrine, and he called it the yeast of the Pharisee, how it will work through your whole life. Listen to some of the things Jesus said about these guys. And this is publicly in front of them and everybody. He, called, he said, you Pharisees, you, 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 you Sadducees, you load people down with rules and burdens, and then you don't lift a finger to help them. He said, you'll go over land and sea to get one convert, but when you get a convert, you make him twice the child of hell he already is. Can I tell you that he didn't get a lot of offerings from these guys? He called them frauds and liars, prideful hypocrites. I love this one. He called them blind guides. If you're going to hire a guide, you don't want to hire a blind guide because typically you should be able to see to lead. And he said, you, you're blind guides. And then he made it even clearer. You're so blind that you strain at a gnat, but you can swallow a camel. And, I, you know, I, I grew up with brothers, so we busted each other's chops all the way. That's a good bust right there. You strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. I, I like that one. He said, they're filthy. He said, you're greedy. You're self-indulgent. Then he said, you stink. He did. Jesus said, you stink. He said, you stink like a rotting corpse. You clean the outside of the grave, but you stink on the inside. You clean the outside of the cup, but it's full of garbage and extortion and, and filth. You are miserably evil on the inside and broken, but all you think you want to do is clean the outside of the cup. He said, you're a snake and you're a viper. You're a murderer. And then he topped it off by saying, by the way, uh, you're all ch and you're children of Satan. That made their day. Do you know on Palm Sunday what Jesus did? Prior to when, when, they were, when he came in and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, he went into the temple. Before he went in, the Bible said he made a whip. He sat down and he made a whip. And the, in the temple, they were changing money. Like if you go to a foreign country, you need their currency. So people were coming to buy sacrifices to offer, but they needed local currency. So in the temple, they would exchange your money so you could buy the sacrifices at the temple. Except they were robbing people and giving them poor rates of exchange and stealing from poor people in the name of giving sacrifices to God and, and the religious leaders getting their cut of this extortion. Jesus sits outside the temple and he makes a whip and he goes inside and the Bible says he starts beating them, driving them out and flipping over the tables of the money changers. See, most people see Jesus. He went in and went, get out. My house is a house of prayer. You have made it a den of thieves. You are so bad. Please leave. No, man, I'm telling you, he went into there and See, Jesus went, he drove them out. He went in and he said, get out! And there were people, what, what, out! And they're like, who is? And he starts beating people. Out! You thieves what you've done to my father's house. And then they're trying to collect their money and he's flipping over the tables, beating people. They're all out. How many of you know that changed that day in the temple? People don't see Jesus that way. Why was he so indignant? Why was he so angry? Because it disgusted him how men would create a system to get to God that was a lie and a fraud. Self-righteousness. If it, if it enters into the Christian's heart, it will make us completely ineffective to the world. Because we will now think that we're better because 
We've been rescued. It's so critically important. Listen to what Galatians 5, verse 4, then verse 9 says about this issue. He said, you who are trying to be justified by the law or by your works have been alienated from Christ and you've fallen away from God's grace. Grace is when God gives you something you cannot merit. Verse 9, he said, and a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. He said, when self-righteousness gets in you, it will work through your whole life. You will judge people based on where you're strong and you will sympathize with people based on where you're weak. You will, you will look at people and you'll say, and you'll pray the prayer of the Pharisee. Jesus said they would strike their chest and say, oh my God, I thank you that I'm not like those people. And Jesus was furious. I'm telling you, he was, he, there was no ambiguity about what he said. So here's the question that we have to ask. Since there is no other way but Jesus, he's the only life preserver. That's it. Not your good works, not your efforts. There's nothing I can do to those without Christ to get them to change their behavior to make them right with God. Remember, good master, what can I do to inherit her eternal life? He said, why do you call me good? There is none good but God. The scripture said there's none righteous, not even one. You cannot earn this. You need a savior. You need someone to reach into your broken world. And these Pharisees were basically putting people on a treadmill that would make them twice the child of hell they already were. And Jesus is about to go to a cross. The sinless, spotless son of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. He is about to go to a cross to be murdered and that the judgment of God that was due me and due them would fall on him. And they're playing these games around the temple and their self-righteousness. And he's about to give his life for them. And it infuriated them. And, I, and my fear in the relationship with God's people and people without Christ is that we are not known for who saved and rescued us. We are known for what we disagree with. Now, please, please don't misinterpret this. I am not saying that there isn't a right and a wrong. I'm not saying that as a Christian, you should not have views that are congruent with the scripture. You should, absolutely. But trying to get people who don't know Christ to come to my point of view will not make them right with God. Just like the Pharisee. They may come to my persuasion, but have they come to Christ? My persuasion is not what saves you. My political perspective does not save you. A savior saves you. Amen. Now, when you came in today, you should have been given... One of these little, little lifesavers. How many of you got these coming in? So, oh man, Pastor, I ate mine already. That's all right. <laughs> On the way out, grab another one. I'll tell you why in a little bit. But you're going to need this in a little bit. I want to make sure if you have it, you know, if you, ladies put it in the purse, drag it out of there. I want to talk to you about it in a minute. Are we known as Christians for who saved us or are we known for what we're against? Luke 15, verse 1, the Bible said tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. Why were people in that condition drawn to listen to Jesus, but often repelled by Christians? What is it that Jesus did with people that were messed up while he still stood for righteousness, that they wanted to hear him? Here's the, here's the dividing line. He loved them. The question I have to have, if, if my Savior loves broken people, of which I was one that he saved, do I have any right but to love the world like he loved them? And after he said, God so loved the world, the next verse, Jesus said, I did not come into the world to condemn it, but that through me the world might be saved. Christ died for us, the Bible said, while we were yet dead in our sins and trespasses. He did this when none of us deserved any of it. Here's a question I would ask. And I'm going to, I'm going to talk in a, for, in a moment about a subject that's going to sting people in this room. And I'm always cautious when I do it. Because the religious person will use this subject to get a crowd worked up and say, that's right, that's right. And forget that there's people in the room that have been crushed by this issue. And it's the subject of abortion. Because I promise you in a room this size, there's people here that have had them. And by the way, they aren't virgin births. There are men involved too. I wonder if a young lady on Friday or Thursday that had an abortion, would she feel like, who felt desperate? 
would her first inclination be, I want to go and be with God's people? I want to go to, I want to, go to church. Or would she feel like she was coming in the enemy's territory? Now, you say, are you, you mean, you're saying abortion is correct? No. No, of course not. You, are you for it? No. No. But did Jesus die so that I could be known for what I'm against? Or did Jesus die so that I can go rescue a person and bring them into the kingdom from death into life so that a savior can change their life? So that no matter what's happened in their past, because when you come to Christ, my Bible tells me that you become a new creation. Old things pass away, everything becomes new. That God said, I take your sin as far as the east is from the west, and I remove it from you. He said, but pastor, I, I've had an abortion. It's unforgivable. Maybe it is for people. And maybe you're struggling to forgive yourself. But if you've come to Christ, and you've taught, and, and I'm telling you, God said, your sins, your iniquities, listen to me, I remember no more. He said, but I remember it. Well, I, I think we're supposed to be like Christ, don't you? So why don't you lay your past aside and realize that his love is greater than your, fear, than your fear, than your sin, than, your, than whatever you've done in your life so that you're not trapped by something that happened. But I, when I go to heaven, that baby will be there. How will we ever, how will we, I, I, won't even, I, I don't even know if I want to go there. Can I tell you when you get to heaven, that's what the Bible said, every tear will be wiped away. Do you realize every regret, every, do you realize that if you have three children and, and had an abortion, do you know that child that was aborted will have the same relationship with you as the other three as if it never happened? Because that's how amazing his grace is. Is that how people see Christians? It doesn't validate a bad decision or a sinful choice. But Jesus came to die for people who have made these choices. In fact, he was charged with being called the friend of sinners. I wonder if that charge would stick to Christians today. That's why we say over and over again, the, the, the message, the, the foundational sentence of this church is to help all people realize that God loves them unconditionally. All people. People that love him, people that hate him. People that curse him, people that worship him. Well, you're saying if God loves them, then they could do whatever they want. No, no. Until you know God loves you, you can't love him back, the Bible said. In fact, the Bible said it is the goodness of God that leads people to change or to repent. Well, I'll tell you one thing. Well, I'm not going to stand up and be kind to people that you and the Pharisees, I agree. But I know the list of things Jesus said to self-righteous people. I don't want to be in that list. I just don't. I just don't. He said, but don't you have strong, I have more, I have more, I have strong opinions. I'm, man, I have strong political opinions. People come to me and say, why don't you talk about your political opinions? Because even if everybody gets elected that I think should get elected, it's still messed up and broken. <laughs> okay, hey, when the Republicans take over, it'll be great. They took it over. Beneath, beneath, beneath. That's all, folks. It's nuts. We need Democrats. We need people who, who have been rescued by a Savior. That's, what, that's our job. Now, the Bible does say when the righteous are in authority, the, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, they mourn. I'm not, I'm not diminishing that. I'm not, I'm not saying that's unimportant. I'm just telling you 10,000 years from now, you're going to want to know who's in heaven and who's in hell and what your part was to keep them out of that place so I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like that discussion of hell. That's, that's just unacceptable to me. I'm, I, don't believe, I don't want to believe in it. Well, look, I don't want to have winter at the end of March. <laughs> but it's here anyway. Yeah. I can't change it. Jesus, listen to what, he, he's now quoting the charge against him. Luke 7, verse 34. The son of man came eating and drinking, you say. He's a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Jesus said, you, you call me the friend of sinners. And he was guilty as charged. Do you know he told the story about the prodigal son? What did he do when the prodigal came back? He, re he received him. He held him. He loved him. He embraced him. He restored him. He forgave him. And that was a story about a prodigal. 
Then there was a woman taken in the very act of adultery. You know the story. They brought her in, the religious crowd, to trap Jesus. And they said that she should be stoned. What do you say? Jesus ignored them. Finally said, he that's without sin among you cast the first stone. They all walked away. He was left alone with the woman. He looked her right in the eyes and he said, woman, where are those that have accused you? Has no man condemned you? She said, no man has condemned me, Lord. He said, listen now, this is the son of God, the sinless, spotless, holy God in flesh, looked at a woman just out of the act of adultery. He said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. What was it about a relationship with him that could set a woman free like that? When he said, go and sin no more, he wasn't telling her that as some type of beating on her head. He was saying, woman, you are no longer have, you no longer have to live this way. You're free. Whom Jesus said, whom the son sets free is free indeed. Can I suggest to you an interaction with God in the flesh might change you a bit. What would happen if the world came in contact, listen now, with God in flesh, which is the body of Christ. Amen. What if we were like Jesus? And then the religious crowd went after him and after him and after him over the issue. But he never bent and he supported that woman, even though they wanted to kill her. One time he was walking and there were huge crowds and this guy named Zacchaeus wanted to see him. And Zacchaeus, the Bible said, was a short guy, so he climbed up in a tree. Zacchaeus was a tax collector. Now, not IRS stuff, okay? Uh, there are good people that work for the IRS, okay? I mean, I know April 15th is coming and all that good stuff, but here, here's the thing. In the Bible, tax collectors that were Jews, they, they, they actually were under, they would use Roman authority to take taxes from their people, but they would take more than what was appropriate and they would get to keep their share. So they extorted money from their people. They were hated. They were seen as traitors and they were hated, hated, hated. Isn't it interesting that one of the people Jesus called to be one of the 12 apostles, we know it as the book of Matthew, was a tax collector. Can you imagine? A book of the Bible written by somebody despised that would have been thrown out of the culture. And Zacchaeus, Jesus is walking. He points at him, he said, Zacchaeus, come out of that tree. He said, I'm going to eat at your house tonight. And the religious crowd went nuts. You eating with that pig? You can't go in his house. How can, and, and all the talk. And you know what Zacchaeus did? He came out of that tree, and here's what he announced. Anybody I've stolen from, I'm giving it back double. Yeah. Something happens when you meet a savior. And something else happens when you meet a self-righteous person who's been saved. One will draw you to the savior. The other will push you away. And I want to help, help with, with all my heart today that we will reach and be the hands and feet of Jesus to a lost and dying world. The woman at the well was a Samaritan woman hated by the Jews. And Jesus said, Where? he said, go get your husband. She said, I'm not married. He said, you're right. You've had, you've been married five times. And the man you're living with, you're not married to. Do you understand if you're living with somebody, you're not married? Jesus said, you aren't. He said, but we feel married. I can feel like a cowboy. It doesn't make me one. <laughs> but I want you to get what he said. This is a despised Samaritan and a woman in that culture. He, he would never have spoken to her. In fact, when the disciples came back and saw him, they were like, what's he doing talking to her? And you know what he did? He more clearly revealed himself as Messiah to that woman than anywhere in the scripture, including his 12. He looked her right in the eyes and he said, I am Messiah. The God of the universe more clearly revealed himself to a woman with five husbands living with a man, and she became an evangelist reaching people across the, that, that part of the world. Again, I'm not telling you that a relationship with God makes your sin no big deal and there's no, everything's right and nothing's wrong. No, 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 no. When you meet a Savior, you get changed. And this woman's life was changed. And the one that amazes me the most is... This happened right around this time of Palm Sunday. He was at a man named Simon's house who was a Pharisee. And Simon was somewhat prideful and he treated Jesus like a contemporary and not anyone that he should give honor to. And you'll know why in a moment. He came into Simon's house and then while they were there, a woman comes in to Simon's house. She's crawling on her hands and knees and she's weeping profusely. And she comes from behind where Jesus is standing and she wraps her arms around his feet. 
And then she begins to pull herself to the front on her face, on her hands and knees, kissing his feet and weeping so much so that it wet his feet with her tears. And then she washed his feet with her hair. And Simon stood there and he was furious. The Bible said that he thought to himself, if this man were a prophet of God, he would know what kind of woman was touching him. This was a prostitute. And Simon was disgusted that she was even in his house. And how could this man let this woman touch him if he were holy? And Jesus said this, because the Bible said Jesus, knowing his thoughts, said, Simon, can I ask you a question? He said, yes, sir. He said, uh, if two people were forgiven a, an amount, one five dollars, one fifty thousand dollars, which one will be, which one will love the most? He said, well, the one that's forgiven fifty thousand. He said, you, you've rightly answered. He said, this woman's sins who were many are now forgiven. And that's why she loves greatly. And Simon was ticked off. Who are you to forgive sins? And then she had a box with her, an alabaster box of precious, expensive perfume that was earned through the, through the work of a prostitute. And she broke it and poured it over him. And he was again furious. Why this waste? This money could have been given to the poor. Why would you waste it in this room and pouring it on his feet? And he looked at Simon and he said, she has anointed me for my burial. Because in Jewish custom, you had, there was an anointing of oil. In this case, it was a very expensive oil to prepare Jesus for his burial. This is the God of the universe who looked over the circle of the earth and he chose a woman who was a prostitute who would have been forgiven to bring oil, this precious oil, to anoint the most significant moment in the history of humanity when Christ would die, be buried, and rise from the dead. He brought a prostitute into that very act to anoint him for burial. The God of the universe used her, and the money to pay for it was through prostitution. Is it possible that we have not grasped the love of God for people? Is it possible that we judge people based on what we see rather than what a Savior can do in their life? Instead of changing her behavior, he rescued her. And then Jesus said this, throughout the rest of human history, what this woman has done today will be told as a memorial for her. And 2,000 plus years later, we're still talking about it. That's who Jesus is. In fact, let, let me... Let me tell you a story about it. How many of you have heard of the Salvation Army? Uh, most, most people think it's where you go buy, you know, clothes at a thrift store or drop your old clothes off. But the Salvation Army does a lot of good. But it didn't start being that kind of work. It was a Salvation Army. It was people that went to win people to Christ. They still do that today. They still have military rankings in the Salvation Army. And there was a man named Booth, and they ended, his name was actually in the, in the organization that he founded called the Salvation Army. He was called General Booth. And what he was about to relate to a group of people that became a movement was how, how loving the world would make us the friend of sinners. We need to love the broken. We need to love those who hate us. We need to love what people would consider, take me as their enemy. I'm not going to be your enemy. Well, let's have a discussion. Discussion won't get you out of, out, out of an eternity without God. Only a savior will. So what if I change your mind? Now what do I have? I have somebody with a changed mind who's still lost. Booth was on a train and God gave him a vision. And he saw this, this darkened sea that was tempest and there was waves going up and down. And in the middle of it was this massive rock that came out of it. And when he looked at the sea, as he looked closer and closer, the waves actually were water, but they were people. As tens upon tens upon tens upon thousands of people were drowning, at one, and he saw it happening. And he was so horrified, it was so real, that he was watching not one person drown, which would be unimaginable, tens of thousands, and he'd watch them come up and grasp and go down and come up and, and then go down and never come up. Screaming for help, the cries were deafening. And he was, he was, so, he was just overwhelmed by it. Then he looked at the rock. And on the rock, there were people, and, and, and he was able to keep going in and zooming into those people. And he saw all these people on the rock. And they were just kind of casually standing there. 
hearing the deafening cries of the people in the sea and ignoring them. And as he looked more closely, there were a few people, you know, every once in a while I would reach in and try to help somebody out. Some people climbed out, but most drowned. Every once in a while they would, excuse me, and they'd help somebody out, and then they'd go back to talking. While hundreds in front of them died. Over and over again, he's, he's watching people do this. He said there were some that were so desperate to save them, they dove into the water risking their life, and they were dragging people to the shore. He said in the midst of that, this great being, and it was Jesus, came from heaven and dove into the sea. And he said, and Christ began to cry out, help me to the people on the rock. Help me. He said he did it so long his voice grew hoarse. And, and a few jumped in to help him. But most, he said, on the shore began to, he, he heard their conversations. They were discussing the politics of the day. They were going to hear sermons about the people in the water. And they actually were having discussions about the people drowning while they drowned. And many of them were asking Jesus to come help them on the rock. While he was crying for them to help him get people out of the sea. That's what Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. This is what he's talking about. That there is a world without Christ. And there is a heaven and there is a hell. And he is so desperate to win and to bring men and women to a saving knowledge and a redemption that he died on a cross. And he said, and then the horror hit me when he spoke to me and he said, everybody on that rock came out of that sea and they forgotten. They, they forgot that they were on their last gasp. I don't know about you. I, I remember what it was like to be alienated from God. It's as fresh to me as it was the day I gave my life to Christ. Don't ever forget that you came out of that sea. And Booth's vision was so compelling that he started the Salvation Army and they won countless people to Christ. The only hope of this world is Jesus. That's it. And that's why I want each of you to, if you didn't need it, grab, take out your, uh, your lifesaver. I'm going to ask you to do something with this for the next five weeks. I'm going to ask you not to throw it away or eat it yet. I want you to put it somewhere in your house where you have to see it all the time. Put it on the end of a counter, right in your kitchen. So I'm OCD, I can't do that. Um, sure you can. You'll be all right. You'll get healed. Just leave, leave it there. And I'm going to talk to you about why here in a minute. But I want you to hear the, the, the heart cry of Jesus. Let me read it to you. In Luke chapter 14, when he cries out that he wants his house filled, what does he mean by that? He wants them out of that sea into the kingdom. Let me read it to you. Luke 14 and verse 16. Jesus replied, a certain man, and that's, this is God, was preparing a great banquet. That's the salvation in Christ. And invited many guests. That's all of us that are saved. Or have the opportunity to be. But at the time of the banquet, he sent his servants, those are already those who are in the kingdom, to tell those who have been invited, come for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said, I've just bought a field, I have to go see it, please excuse me. Another said, I just bought five yoke of oxen, I'm on my way to try them out, please excuse me. Another said, I just got married, I can't come. I don't know why that is. I'm not going to read into that one. Verse 21. The servant came back to the master, reported this to his master. The owner of the house, that's God, became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly. Everybody say quickly. quickly. Go out quickly into the streets, the alleys of the town, and bring in. Say bring in. bring in. That means go get them and bring them. Bring in the poor, crippled, blind, and lame. Sir, the servant said, what you've ordered has been done. There's still room. Then the master told his servant, now you then go out into the highways and the hedges. If you read the word hedges in the Greek, it means divided places. How many of you think we live in a divided culture? We are to take the love of God and the message of a Savior into every divided place. But the church, has be, it's been broken. We've become the enemy. Go into every divided place and you make them come in so that my house will be full. An empty seat is really a big deal to God. Because it requires, he's saying, do you not understand you came out of that sea? Go and compel them to come. 
Jesus said, I am the light of the world. But then he turned around and he looked at you and me and he said, you are the light of the world. You are a city on a hill. The last thing Jesus said before he ascended, you go into all the world and preach this good news. What's the good news? That if you give your life to Christ, your sin debt is canceled. You become a child of God and you're heaven bound and you've been rescued, put on the rock. He said, you tell them the good news for everyone that believes it will be saved. Now listen, this is what Jesus said. And he who rejects it will be damned and condemned. And do you see why Jesus was so filled with fury against self-righteousness? And he's screaming in that water, help me. That's the cry to every Christian. And I don't know if you've ever been like me. Life can get busy. And we can forget we came out of that seat. In a moment, I'm going to pray for all of us as we hold these little lifesavers in our hand. Jesus is the Savior of the world, but then he commissioned us as his body to go bring that message which saves them to the world. And so, in a sense, you're a lifesaver. So I want you to keep this where you see it over the next five weeks for a reason. So you can, every time you see it, and I hope from now on, every time you get a lifesaver, you remember, this is why I'm on the earth. This is why I'm here. Can I tell you 10,000 years from now, when we are in heaven, nothing will matter to you other than who is there and who isn't. And when you understand the charge of bringing the message to who gets there is given to you, I'm convinced that there's going to be a lot of hard conversations in heaven. People coming to pastors like me saying, really? That's what you told me about? Why didn't you make it real to me? Why didn't you tell the truth? Why didn't you help me to step into the reason? Because what I want every one of you to do in the next five weeks is right now I'm going to pray that God will put somebody in your heart, a whole family. I don't care what they're going through, who they are, what they, if they have a pulse, bring them. In fact, Jesus said, compel them. Make it compelling. Easter and then the four weeks following is at the movies. I'm telling you, it's going to be fantastic. They'll have at the movies in all the kids' rooms, all the, the student, uh, you know, teenagers, all the way through. They will have an incredible time, as will you, but it is designed, and, and it will help you as well. The messages are incredible, tied to the movies. It's, it's a rem I'm telling you, you're going to be thrilled you came, and anyone you bring will be thrilled that they came, whether they choose to respond to Christ or not. But I'm going to pray right now that God put somebody in your heart that's far from him. So that you can do what Jesus said as a servant to go into the highways and the byways and the hedges and the divided places and compel them to come and bring them. Let me pray for you. Father, I pray for every person here under the sound of my voice. In Jesus' name, I pray that you right now would put someone in our heart, someone that we work with, we know in our neighborhood, a family member, whomever. And if no one's in our heart, someone we can purpose in our heart to go reach. The Lord, you would fill our hearts with that person. In Jesus' name, I thank you for that. Amen. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to do something very simple. And we're going to pray and we're going to kind of wind this down today. If I'm going to ask every one of you who are willing to stand with me to go be one of those servants, that in the next five weeks, that you pick, take one or two of them. <clears throat> Or maybe you're going to be like the Steckmans over the, when we did the family uh, of the Christmas program. They, had, they, they brought a bus of people. A bus from East Liverpool, Ohio. Well, that's a little bit extreme. Not if you're watching somebody drown. So we pray God gives me courage. No, I won't. You don't need courage. What you need is, is to be able to realize that you're walking past a drowning person. Can I ask you a question? If you're walking past a pool, this was in your hand. You can't swim, you can't be the savior, but you've got this in your hand. And the person's drowning and they're going to die and they're in front of you. Would you suggest you need courage to throw this? All you would need is an awareness. Oh my God, they're dying, they're drowning. Here, 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 grab this. People, the reason they need courage is they haven't had their eyes open to what's happening in that sea and what the outcome of it is. And that we have forgotten we came out of that sea that someone brought a savior to us and so my hope for every one of you today 
is in a moment I'm going to ask everyone who desires to do this to stand with me and I'm going to pray a prayer over our lives that God would open doors. That over next, I realize Easter is sometimes a family thing. You can't invite people. I get that. But the next four weeks at half the movies, that next week, I'm telling you, if you'll bring people that first week, this thing will explode because they'll want to come back and, you, and tell them they can bring people. And you will be thrilled that you came and you will be thrilled that you brought people. And 10,000 years from now, if you've never won anyone to Christ in your life, this next five weeks, 10,000 years in heaven, this will be maybe the only thing that you will ever be able to look back on that lasted. I pray that's not the case. But do you realize people live and die who've come out of that sea and never go back in? And I'm not saying that as a place of guilt. It's just a fact because life could get busy for all of us. If you're going to make a decision with me, fill my house, not a church, a kingdom, a kingdom of people who were lost and are now found in darkness and light, hell bound, heaven bound. If you want God to use you in this next, these next five weeks, if you're going to go and trust him, to go and, and compel them, bring them with you and see God do a great thing. Bring their whole family. Every one of them will be touched. I'm going to ask you right where you're at, just stand with me right now. And I'm going to pray for you. Let's believe God together and let's go reach this world. This is why Jesus said, put the kingdom first. He said, everything on the rock, I'll add to you. But I, my hope is as you stand with me, you'll hear the cry of Jesus who gave his life for the people in the sea like you and me that came out of it. And he's saying, help me. Go into that sea. Tell them that there's a savior, a savior of the world. As you hold this in your hand as a point of contact, let me pray for you. Father, I pray for every person standing today that in these next five weeks, that for some in this room, they'll do it five weeks in a row and they will never regret a day of it. Certainly not in this life, and certainly not in the life to come. But the people that are in our hearts right now, I don't ask for courage. I ask for an open eye to see, an open heart to understand that there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. And without a savior, they will not go to heaven. For Jesus, you said, I am the way, truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. You are the only one who paid that price. And I, and we choose today to dive into that sea from which we were delivered. Not to be anyone's opponent, but to bring a savior. And Lord, I thank you that in these coming weeks, the, this Easter weekend coming and the At The Movie series, that more people will come to Christ in these five weeks than in any five weeks combined in the history of this church. I pray, not, not, well, Lord, I pray you do something. You'll do nothing if we don't go into the sea. But I know when they're here, you'll move heaven and earth because you shed blood for them. And I pray for those people right now that their lives will never be the same again. And I pray for those who are going to go get them. I know our lives will never be the same again. We trust you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated as we conclude tonight, today. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if you're here and you don't know Christ as the Lord of your life, if today you drew your final breath and slipped into an eternity, do you know where you'd spend it? Please don't leave here without receiving Jesus. I'll pray for you right where you're seated with every head bowed and every eye closed. If you've never given your life to Christ or you're not sure, please know that being good doesn't do it. Going to church doesn't do it. No church can do this for you, including this one. No pastor, no priest, no sacrament, including this church only by receiving Christ. So if you're here today or you're watching online, people watch this all over the world with us right now. Hundreds of people across the world are watching right now. If you're watching, this is for you as well. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. If you've never given your life to Christ or you're not sure, say, Pastor, please include me in that prayer. I will pray for you right, right where you're seated. And the whole church will pray the prayer out loud together with you. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Just simply raise your hand right where you're seated. I'll include you in that prayer. Do it right now and we'll pray. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you guys. See you all in that whole top row. God bless you. 
best decision of your life. If you raised your hand or you should have, pray this out loud where you hear it and we'll pray it together with you. Jesus will come into your heart. He'll take you out of that seat and he'll put you on a rock because he's the only one who can. Pray it where you hear it and we'll pray it with you. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name and I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the Son of God. He died on a cross to bear my sin debt. I open the door of my heart, the door of my life. And Jesus, I invite you in. I receive you now as the Lord of my life. Thank you for putting me on that rock. Amen. Amen. Give them a hand, would you? Best decision of your life. Incredible.